Good day. This is Chris with the Spiritual Artist Podcast. I'm really thrilled to have you here today listening. Um, I just got back from beautiful Santa Fe. And as you know, I love Santa Fe. It's calming. It's peaceful. I get connected to myself and kind of thinking about, ironically, what, what do I need to do with my business and where do I go from here? I just finished a show. And so I'm kind of revamping up and going, okay, Okay, what's next? So today's guest is kind of perfect for that. It's perfect to share with you. Um, I would be introducing Jason Porsche. He is the owner of a gallery, Xanadu Gallery, and a second generation art business professional. That's right. We're going to bring in some somebody that's from the other side, the other perspective, someone that looks at artists from a distance and says, hey, this is what they should do and shouldn't do. And as you know, uh, last year, I interviewed someone from Provincetown. Um, and she was a gallery owner, and this is on the other other side of the United States, which is interesting. So I want to share with you that Jason's father was a uh, recognized oil painter, John Porsche, and he is not an artist himself, Jason, but he has a passion for the business side of the art. And I've already chastised him on saying he's not an artist. <laughs> so anyway, good day, Jason. How are you? I'm doing great, Chris. Thanks for having me. I am I am excited to have you. Um, I connected with you through my friend Melanie, who I also went to Santa Fe with, and she's been taking your online course, I believe. Is that correct? That's correct. Yes. And you've been doing that a while now, it sounds like. Yes. So um, I, I, just just briefly, you gave me a great introduction, um, but my wife and I uh, founded Xanadu Gallery in Scottsdale in 2001. Um, uh, Another story, but our, our grand opening day was September 11th, 2001. So we opened uh-huh. right into a unique environment, uh, but we've been able to build uh, a successful gallery business over the years, connect with collectors and artists from all over the world. Um, and, and that's kind of what you would anticipate it to be, right? The, the gallery where we have collectors coming in, we're interacting with them, we're building relationships with artists. But in about 2007, 2008, um, uh, after having had many conversations with artists who were visiting the gallery and with some of the artists that I was representing um, uh, about the art business and kind of trying to dispel some misconceptions, I decided that I would start writing a blog on the business of art. Um, And I started publishing Red Dot Blog And my idea was that I wanted to be able to give artists some perspective into into the business side of art. But in particular, I wanted to talk about um, how galleries work, how artists might interact with galleries and build more successful relationships with them, how to approach galleries. And the blog took off right away. Um, You know, obviously, that was a, a topic that was of a lot of interest to artists. And so um, I I just kind of continued building on that um, and got more and more demand for information specifically on how to approach galleries. That led me to start doing a series of workshops for artists. um, And and I ended up traveling uh, around the country. Um, I happened to have a bit of time to do that in 2008, 2009, as we went through the Great Recession and and those kinds (laughs) of things. Um, But Um, I just saw that there was this real interest in and hunger for that kind of information. And then that ultimately led led me to uh, write a book on the topic, Starving to Successful. That had been very successful. And so it's just been an ongoing conversation that I've been able to have with the artist community. I continue to blog extensively um, and do online workshops. I'm not traveling as much anymore. And and of course, the gallery has gotten busier and busier. Uh, But I've just found great satisfaction in having this relationship with artists. As you mentioned, my father is a, a, a painter. And so I got to grow up in the art world and I get got to see kind of both sides of the, the business, um, you know, from the perspective of an artist and from a gallery. And so it's just been fun to kind of interact with artists on that level. Yeah, I, I uh, it sounds like you're doing great with it. And Melanie always comes and she shares your ideas with me. And I, I think I told you earlier when we chatted that I hope you don't mind. She's like telling me stuff. I'm like, mm, that's a good idea. Maybe I should create a book. No, or, absolutely. You know? <laughs> no, I think the more information that's out there for artists, the better. And, and as I said, from what I've seen, 
um, there just seemed to be a little bit of a vacuum um, in terms of, of that kind of information, a lot of desire to know more. I think there's a misperception about artists that, you know, all an artist wants to do is be artistic and create. They don't want to have anything to do with the business side of things. So what I found is that, no, that's not true. They just want to have good, solid information and a plan of attack. And that if they have that, um, it actually frees them up to be more creative and to to find more success in their career. Well, you know, that it's something I always hear from people. You know, it, everybody's just, it's, you'll, you'll hear one thing and then you hear the opposite and you'll hear one thing and then you hear the opposite, which leads us to what brought us into this because Mel called me up and said, yeah, my, my guy says um, quantity over quality that you should just do a lot of work. And, and of course, you know, uh, Jason, my whole thing is, is, you know, get grounded and get connected and reflect in your art. Now, not to the point of not working, but take your time with it, be consciously present. And I'll tell you what, at first, or it, Chris, I will say Chris, a year ago would have been like, absolutely not. Art should be take, take its time. But I just finished that show. And I had to produce 12 large paintings within three months. And I'll tell you what, Jason, you're right. There was nothing like forcing yourself to to achieve to produce quickly it 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 yeah. i started realizing there were new skills that i didn't realize i had i started expanding my artistic toolbox i was like oh wow i didn't know i could do that and and looking for ways to make each panel different and not the same and also just that ever present clock right yeah clock so, so why do you feel that? Why do you feel that? Yeah. So, um, it, it, this, this blog post I wrote, and I will tell you, it has been, um, one of the most viral, most shared blog posts that I've done. And it has also been one of the most controversial blog posts that I've ever done. Although I should say, I think that maybe the title is the most controversial part of it, because as you read the blog post, I think you'll find that I'm not suggesting an artist should be churning out loads of low quality artwork. In fact, quite the opposite. Um, but my suggestion is that there is some quality that can only come through quantity. That as an artist focuses on producing more art and gaining more experience, putting more miles on the paintbrush and moving through tons of clay, that there is um, just some some um, insight and skill that an artist gains that really is difficult to achieve in any other way. Um, and that's not to say, you know, it's, in, in kind of thinking about this question, the dichotomy is between or, or the perceived dichotomy is between an artist who is in the studio, you know, carefully sweating over each and every decision and, and brush stroke and, you know, striving to achieve a masterpiece as opposed to an artist in the studio just kind of throwing paint around, so to speak. And um, uh, again, I just don't think that that's the actual decision that an artist has to make um, and, and that there is just this opportunity by spending some time focused on output and production to, to really see an advance in the kind of work that is coming out of the studio. And so, um, you know, that that framing it that way, quality versus quantity, um, obviously yeah. is going to lead to some discussion and some some concern. Um, but my suggestion is that we want to be aiming for both. Right. You know, it's funny. Uh, it's an it's an and statement. I, I love that. Uh, yes. So, you know, people say or, or with the, which which is always duality. But actually what you're saying is and, you know, that's right. Do both do both. And, and, and I love what you said. You said that there's a quality that comes out of quantity. I, I think that's right. And, and again, this comes from, um, again, not personal experience, but years of interacting with artists and kind of seeing their habits and practices in the studio, um, kind of gauging the success that I, I observe artists experiencing in the real world as they're out showing their work in galleries or, um, you know, doing open studio tours and that kind of thing. And that is that um, th I, I find an interesting parallel between artists who you would describe as successful and artists who you would describe as prolific that, um, you know, just kind of some of the realities of the art business are such that the more work you have, 
under your belt and the more work you're able to put out into the world, the, the bigger the surface you're creating for experiencing that kind of success, um, the better you're going to be able to supply galleries, the more collectors you're going to be able to reach. And so there's just multiple benefits that come from shifting into a mindset of uh, quantity. Um, and, and, you know, we should be clear that there are that there are certainly going to be some trade offs in this process, you are going to be making some decisions about your output, um, you know, and especially artists whose work has been focused on being highly detailed or, um, you know, very considered. Um, and, and, and so I, I deliberately am somewhat ambiguous and vague about what I mean by quantity. Um, and so I'm not saying to artists, you must produce 200 pieces of artwork per year um, or, or anything like that. Um, rather, what my suggestion is that an artist should kind of look over their current level of production or maybe what they've produced over the last year and simply strive to increase that. Um, you know, maybe think about what you could do to increase your output by a quarter over the next year and see what amazing things happen when you have that kind of focus. And in my interaction with a lot of artists, what I found is that they're not even thinking in that way at all. Maybe they're not even aware of how much artwork they've produced over the last year or thinking in terms of how many pieces I'm producing per month or per year. Um, and so even just that subtle mind shift can make a big difference in getting work done. And I think the one other big advantage that I'll mention is that um, I suspect that many artists labor over artwork a lot longer than maybe they should, that the piece becomes finished and then they keep going um, mm -hmm. and find themselves, um, you know, almost belaboring the, the, the work in the end. And that having this mindset of focusing on getting work done and, and cr increasing your output um, can really shift the, um, the, 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 the whole approach to your artwork, your, your yeah, artistic you know, practice. Jason, you just mentioned three things I have to pick up on. So I have to interrupt you. The first one was when you talk about quantity, I'm not sure if you've re ever read Malcolm Gladwell when he talks about Absolutely. the, the 10,000 hour rule or something that you have to spend so many hours a week for 10 years to become like in the top 95% of people in your industry. It's he he goes back and shows that even um the founders of iMac and and Macintosh, Steve Jobs, it was because where he was at the time with the technology, he had access to it early in his life, earlier than most of us did. And, sure. and so he was able to get all that time in. You know, so when you talk about quantity, that's actually very justifiable with that rule, right? I mean. Yeah, um, absolutely. That um, there just is no substitute for being in the studio creating. And in some ways, um, you know, I've seen that in my gallery business. Um, my wife and I, naive as we were, opened our gallery when I was 26 years old and she was 23. And so, you know, here we are, um, you know, several, a, a couple of decades later, um, and and successful, and you you, you know it'd be easy from the outside to just say, oh wow, you must be brilliant um, and and a great business person. And what I'd say is, well, I I am striving for that, but I suspect that more of our success has come simply because we've had a longer time to work on it and to learn the ins and outs. And so yes, I agree with you, Chris. I think that there is um, you know just some advantage to being in the studio and gaining experience. Um, and, and so I would encourage, uh, every artist to fight for that, to, to, uh, you know, carve out time that they can spend creating, um, uh, and, and to focus on, um, you know, developing their, their, um, skills and, and that kind of thing that way. Yeah. You know, one of the, and so another thing that I thought about, which was really interesting, you know, I always try to teach people about what I call intuition and listening to that impulse. So when you paint, you are having a conversation with that painting. And so you do a stroke and you look at it and you react to it. And you look, you look at it and you react and you listen and you look and you react. And so when you have to do quantity, it's going to make you get better and better at listening. And quicker, faster. Right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You're no. going to learn to hear it right away. And instead of going, oh, I heard it, but I'm going to ignore you and do the opposite, which is what a lot of us do, right? <clears throat> you hear the impulse, you go, oh no, that color won't work. I'm going to go with this color, but listen to that impulse. 
Well, and and the result of that, and and you know, it's easy for us here to kind of be speaking theoretically and say, oh, your work is going to get better. You're going to see these massive improvements. But let's not um, ignore the fact that you're also going to increase the number of failures that you experience. There's going to be some work that just is not going to turn out. And and truthfully, it may not turn out because you were working more quickly. Um, but even that, even learning what doesn't work um, can have a tremendous benefit um, to, to your future success. And um, so I just, you know, obviously it is going to be this the, the, this tension that's going to exist for, for every creator to kind of think about balancing um, how much I can produce versus how good it's going to be and kind of finding and striking that right balance. And, um, you know, I do work with some artists who are much slower in their output um, and are only putting out, uh, you know, a few dozen pieces per year. And then I work with some artists who are putting out over 100 pieces per year. And, and what I would hope to emphasize is, again, it's not the number per se. It's just that effort to push yourself. It's the striving for more output um, that that ultimately is is going to move the needle um, forward, and and we just want to be focused on that. And and again, I've just seen time and again that the artists that I work with in my gallery and that I'm able to sell well are those artists who uh, are are very much focused on being in the studio and producing great work. Well, you know, uh, one of the things you were saying is you're going to make mistakes, and that's true. I I was working on this show, and because I was under a rush, I tell you, I was looking for the fast way to make an effect. I was like, how can I make that effect faster? And so I did these panels and I did a draft of it quickly and it, it did work. So I did a second revision of it. I took the color out and I went black and white monochromatic. Still, it didn't work. I had to do three layers on that painting. I, I put it aside, came back to it and painted over it. And you have to be willing to paint over it. Right? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, and um, and uh, I I I one hundred percent agree with that, and um, I've been in many artist studios over the years, and have seen the results of those, you know, many layers of paint, and and um, you know the the agony that's gone into to those unsuccessful pieces, but rarely do I get expressions of regret that the you know that the effort was put forth. Um, and and that even again, even the failures are are important parts on the road to success. So um, and uh, the other thing I would say is that a lot of the artists who are in this mindset pretty quickly learn that even some of the pieces that they might have thought were failures previously maybe aren't as much that maybe they were being too hard on themselves and that even those pieces, once they get out into the world, actually can get. A, a terrific reaction and can sell. And um, that that I think another side benefit of this process is that maybe you learn not to be quite such a self-critic, that you're not as hard on yourself as you maybe would have used to have been. Um, and, and along with that comes a greater level of confidence um, for an artist going into the world. And so uh, I, again, I just see multiple benefits that come from a shift in mindset to bar start thinking about putting out more work. So when you sent this blog out, what was your favorite like antagonistic response to it? <laughs> yeah, um, I, the, I, I'll tell you, a lot of the response was, oh, of course, a gallery owner would say this. They just want to turn you into an art producing machine and they don't care about the quality. It's all about the money. Um, to which I respond, you're not totally wrong. I mean, as a gallery owner, that has to be one of my primary concerns is um, you know, generating sales. And um, I'm not sure why that would be seen as a negative, although I understand it it can be. Um, but e even more than that, um, a lot of times I, I suspect that those kinds of responses came from people who didn't read past the headline and didn't look for ultimately what the, the aim of the article was. And so um, I, I try not to take those kind of things too personally. And, you know, if you go to that blog post, you'll see that there are far more uh, positive comments and responses than there are negative. And, and, and that's what I love about being able to post something like this online and they get commentaries that it really does open up a dialogue and gets people thinking 
um, about the possibilities. And I don't mind if someone disagrees with me. I would just love for them to hear both sides of the conversation. Um, and ultimately, maybe they decide that, uh, no, I'm not interested in in uh, quantity. That's great. But now at least you've had that uh, that discussion and you've made a decision from an informed point of view and you've decided that you're going to go in your direction, you know, uh, based on what what you value. And and I I respect that completely. Um, and, and I would never want to insist that, uh, you know, it's a requirement that everyone start cranking out the artwork, but rather I just enjoy that, that conversation. Well, yeah, I, ma I imagine you're in a tough position because as a gallery owner, you have all the, let's face it, you have a lot of egos. <laughs> That's egos right. On uh, egos on both sides, right? The Absolutely. Artist, and then the buyer. And so you're kind of want to like, you want to help. You're them. forgetting the gallery owner. There's plenty of ego there too. So <laughs> I was being nice. <laughs> I was, just, I was being nice to you. I was like, no, nah, not there, but, but you know, there's all that ego and you're, and you, and you, yeah, you want to give advice, you know? And, and I, I ran an ad agency for 25 years and I would, I would get frustrated because oftentimes I had good advice, but it was, I had to get around the ego of the person hearing it and it's, it's challenging, right? Yeah, yes, definitely. And so the hope is, um, and, and and this is a little bit of the, the reverse side of the internet, and that is that a lot of times people will come into a conversation hot with lots of opinions. And so you don't have an opportunity to build a relationship and to understand where each other are coming from. Uh, but my hope is, and, and this is where a blog has been nice, is that hopefully someone maybe saw this shared, this post shared on social media, they came, they they had opinions, they read through it, but then maybe they click through and read some of my other posts. And I try to post a on a wide variety of topics. Yes, the business of art, but I also love art history. And so I love doing posts, um, you know, about great works of art from art history. Um, and I hope that, that that broader dialogue that I'm having that, hey, we're involved in something that is incredible, you know, that's so important to culture, um, to human history, and um, I'm interested in every aspect of that. I'm focused on the business side of things. And my hope is that um, you can gain something from what I've learned over the years and, and, and take it to be a benefit in your pursuit of your art. And, um, you know, if, if an artist is able to say that they've done that, then I feel like I've succeeded, um, you know, my quest to share information online. I, th I think that's smart. You know, the goal is never to have everybody agreeing with you. But the goal is to have us think about things and be conscious and co make conscious decisions. You know, I had to make a conscious decision when I was doing that painting on one, one aspect to slow down because it was important that I took my time with the detail. But it did challenge me, like you said, and, and being in that compressed time, it did challenge me to grow as an artist. Yeah. And I think you bring up a really interesting point. And again, I would would maybe um invite or or suggest that artists strive to have those kinds of opportunities where they are stretched um you know yes it would be great if if we could just be in the studio creating and um somehow magically all of our needs were met and money was flowing in and we didn't have to do any of the other stuff um I, you know i think that's probably many artists dream but the reality is that these opportunities participating in a show or doing an open studio event um, the, the, the things that pull you out of your comfort zone are the things where you're going to experience the, the greatest growth and where you're going to come back into the studio enriched and excited and um, thrilled to try something new. Yeah. You know, people see the end result and they, and they picture that you're like in there just painting and having a joyful time, but it was five months of really incredible highs, but also really incredible lows. Like, Oh my God, what was I thinking? And yeah, you got to have both. <laughs> you have to have both, right? It's both. And it, without those lows, you don't get to the highs, you know, but there were times where you're sitting there going, Oh my God, why did I do this? Why did I commit to this show? And then, and then, so I, I loved when the show ended, I could look back and look at that journey and I go, wow, what a journey, right? Yes. W what a journey it was. So I'd like to, to while we have you here and because you have such an interesting perspective and so many people want to know about how to submit, how to get into a gallery, if you would share with our listeners, like what maybe like top two things or three things that you think are really key to getting noticed by a gallery or 
forming a relationship? Yes. Yeah. I think um, first is that um, it's important to understand, and, and, and one of the most common questions I'll get either in comments or, or via email is, am I good enough to show in a gallery? Um, and often that'll be accompanied by some images of artwork. Um, and, and my instantaneous response often comes without even having glanced at the artwork. And that is that there's a high likelihood that yes, you are good enough to show in galleries. Um, you know, it's not some objective uh, bar out there where uh, an artist suddenly achieves gallery worthiness, so to speak. Um, it's important to understand that there are many different galleries. Every gallery is owned and run by a different personality. They have different perspectives and interests in life. Uh, there are galleries in a variety of different art markets. And, um, you know, our whole purpose in existing is finding artwork to, uh, you know, basically align it with collector interest and, and demand. And so um, there's just, we, we live in such a broad art market with so many different interests that I'm convinced that every artist can find a home uh, in a gallery and that the, the, the sooner you start that process, the better off you're going to be because each of your relationships with galleries is going to bring you new experience and new wisdom and, and, and you know, encourage you to, to strive to create better work and, and so on. And so, um, you know, I think my first suggestion would be that you want to just start that process of thinking about finding galleries to represent your work as early as you can and, and just dive into it. And I will tell you, um, over my career, I have worked with artists um, as young as 14 years old um, wow. and, and as old, I was a, an artist's first gallery uh, and he was 87 years old when he got into into my gallery. Um, and so there's just the whole spectrum out there. And, and there are just more opportunities than you might imagine. I think the second thing I might suggest comes back to the work itself. And that and, and this can be another controversial suggestion. <laughs> well, so just step um, out I'll there, throw Jason. it in just... here. Yeah. <laughs> well, that is that um, in addition to striving to producing a good amount of work and, and good quality work that an artist should be focused on creating consistent and cohesive work. Um, and by that, I mean that we want when a collector walks into a gallery and sees a grouping of your work, um, they can recognize all of it as yours. And when they walk into another gallery across the country and see your work again, they instantly recognize it as being yours as well. That the more um, cohesive and tight you can be there, uh, the better off we can be. And of course, the the concern that's raised to that suggestion by many artists is, oh, I, you know, I, I love experimenting. I love trying new things. I love going in different directions. I don't want to become bored by my artwork. Um, and, and, you know, how will I know what I'm good at unless I try a, a variety of different subjects and styles? And I, I completely understand that. And again, I'm not suggesting that, that you become an art robot or an art factory, but um, the reality of the business is such that in order for a gallery to build success around your artwork, they need to be able to do marketing, they need to be able to promote your work, and they need to be able to sell it multiple times. And if you're if each and every piece of artwork coming out of your studio is completely new and completely different, it's like the gallery has to start over each time. And, and not just the gallery, you as well, if you're marketing your own work. And so um, certainly an artist in the early phases of, of her or his career should be um, experimenting and moving in different directions and, and finding out where their passion is. But as soon as you find that passion, then it's time to turn in the other direction and start really diving deeply into that passion and, you know, to explore the, the same style and subject matter repeatedly. There's some mastery that comes there as well as you, as you start that repetition. And I'm not suggesting either that you have to produce the same piece of artwork over and over and over again, just that you want to be striving to find a common thread in your work that really helps tie it all together. And then just one other suggestion um, there are many other variables to consider as you're thinking about approaching galleries, but but the one other big one is that once you do start approaching galleries, we want to be thinking about approaching many galleries. Um, you know, I've, I will have conversations with artists and they'll say to me, yeah, 
I tried showing my artwork to galleries, but they just weren't interested. They were rude. Um, apparently, I'm just I, I'm not going to find a relationship with galleries. And I'll say, oh, really? And, and how many galleries did you talk to? Gosh, I must have talked to three or four different galleries. To which I would say, oh boy, that that is just not nearly a large enough sampling to draw any kind of conclusion. Um, it, it really is a numbers game when we start thinking about building relationships. I mean, if you if you've had the opportunity to participate in an art festival and show your work that way, you know that the vast majority of people coming into your booth, are, they may like your work, but not enough to make a purchase or or to become a collector. Well, it's that same. It's those same kind of numbers when we start talking to gallery owners. Um, you know, some may be interested, some maybe not. Those that are interested, many of them aren't going to be looking for new artists at the time, or your work isn't going to be a fit for them. And we just have to get through a many no's before we can get to a gallery owner who says, "Yes, I love what you're doing, and and I want to show your work." And so my suggestion is to start developing a nice, long, deep list of galleries now in a variety of markets. So that when you are ready to put your portfolio out there, um, you can be thinking in that mindset as well, that I need to put it in front of, um, I would say, not just dozens, but potentially hundreds of gallery owners oh um, to find those ones who are going to be interested in representing me. It's just I've got to got to push. Now, it often doesn't take that many um, submissions, but having that mindset is going to put you in a better place and having a nice deep list is going to help you feel uh, it's going to help you take rejection less personally to know that, uh, well, that gallery owner wasn't interested, but I'm going to move on to the next one who might be. Yeah. You know, it's funny. It's, it's like dating or something, you know, you didn't, you didn't marry the first person you went out with. Right. Well, some of us did Chris, but uh, <laughs> no, no, that's right. You know, you, you're, you're going to have failures along the way there too. And so, um, you know, we just, we got to be, um, resilient and persistent in, in our pursuit of, of those kinds of relationships. Well, now I want to take you back to your second point, because that's, a, that's an interesting one for me. And, you, you know, I, I fall on that. Uh, I, I figure I have you here. I can get some free advice. <laughs> Absolutely. You, you talk about, I, I have developed a couple different, I call them styles, but I'm very aware that they're different styles. So would you recommend um, and I, I know what you're talking about because I ran an art festival for several years and I would see people's booths where they had every kind of style in their booth and people walk up and they don't know who you are. Yeah. They're they like, get dizzy. They get dizzy. They're like, well, who is he contemporary? Is he traditional? Is he, you, you really want to have some sort of theme. However, would you recommend that if you have like two different various that you love doing styles that you target them separately, that you actually package them separately, submit them separately? Yeah, that's definitely an option. And, you know, it it does take, it, it, I, I think it's often difficult for the artists themselves to know for sure what, what is consistent, what isn't. Um, and so if you can, I would, would start showing the work to um, maybe your fellow artists and getting their feedback and input on the consistency or potential inconsistency of the work, show it to gallery owners uh, and start to take some feedback. You know, you do have some latitude. Uh, the, the way I like to think about it is that there are five or six, five or six key elements to consistency. Um, and, and so among those, I would include your subject matter, your style, the, the larger thematic elements of the work, the medium that you're working in, the presentation of the work, how you're framing it or not framing it. And if you're consistent in three of those five or six areas, um, it's likely that the work is consistent enough to show together. So it, it does give you some latitude. So I've worked with artists who maybe have a variety of subject matter, but because they're so consistent in their palette um, and the way they present the work, you're still able to tie those different subjects together. Or likewise, I've had artists who work in different media, you know, maybe bronze sculpture and painting but because the subject matter is so consistent, those works can show together. So it can be done. You just want to be deliberate about how you position the work and how you tie it together. If, however, after that kind of analysis, you do find, nope, I actually do have two distinctly different bodies of work. They're going to appeal to different potential buyers, um, different galleries. Uh, then you could potentially think about creating separate portfolios and presenting them um, individually. 
Uh, I've even worked with an artist who used a pseudonym with one body of work because she didn't want to confuse collectors who might see her work online. Um, and so those are certainly um, possibilities and, and can be considered when you've got multiple bodies of work. I would just issue a caution there. And that is that it's difficult to be, it's difficult enough to be one successful artist, let alone trying to be two successful artists at the same time. Um, you're going to find some 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 challenges there. And, and so it's often the case that I might suggest to an artist, keep the work separate, focus on one of those bodies of work as your, um, you know, kind of your your area of work that you're looking to market and promote and build a business around. And maybe keep the other line of work as a, a kind of side project or a personal project. Um, and maybe you're just creating it for yourself right now, but focus on getting that first body of work out into the world and building, um, you know, successful promotion around it and collectorship. And then once that body of work has taken off and you feel that it's very stable and successful, then you can come back to this other body of work and start thinking about promoting it at that point. So. Um, so that you're not diluting your efforts as you go out into the world and, and try to build successful sales. Yeah, that, that that does make sense. It's like a problem for people that are more down the road. But first, let's just get one, like you said, get one gallery yeah. to represent one style. I, I, I do think it's funny. Um, I let myself do a couple different styles in this recent show. And yet, People came in and said, oh, you know, I, I tell I teach that we all have certain shapes and curves and there's things that are native to us that are you almost can't help it. You can't help it. And yeah. So this lady goes, well, I see you have this shape. And it was sure enough, the same shape was in a very literal painting as opposed to an abstract, because, yes, it's it's part of my creative DNA. And I just love that. Shame. Yeah, and so that may might be an argument that even though you have developed these these different subjects, that there's still enough consistency there that you might find galleries willing to to show both. And so it's worth experimenting with that and just kind of seeing where um, what kind of feedback you get as you start putting both bodies of work out into the world. Yeah, I mean, it definitely it it, it it's something you just have to test and see. But I love how you said that even your color palette can be native to you, I would say native to you. And even if your designs are different, you're, you're, that's gonna come out, right? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so you, you're, I, you said it's a numbers game and, and go for all the numbers. You said um, to just push one type of work, what was the third one? I missed that. There was a uh, the, the first one is just feeling like you are ready to deserving. do it in gallery where you deserve it. Yes. Yeah. No one's it. going to come along and give you a certificate um, or a license to go out and start promoting your work. That's never going to happen for any artist. Um, and so with that in mind, I just wouldn't wait for it. I would go out into the world and, and start pushing my work out there. I, I think that's a really good one, too, because I think so many people uh, get in insecure with who they are or they think they're not good enough and the fact is there's someone out there for everyone there's something that's for right everyone, yeah you know yeah and um you know you want to avoid that I, I i've met many artists over the years who i suspect feel like oh my best work is coming give me six months and then i'll be ready and if you talk to them six months later they're pretty sure that six months down the road they're going to be ready and and it can just kind of be this ever receding goal um, and, and I would just suggest there's no need to wait for it, that um, you can be continuing to progress at the same time that your work is out there and being enjoyed. And let's remember, um, if you're not putting forth that effort to show your work, um, whether it's showing it yourself or getting it into the galleries, you're not just depriving yourself of those opportunities to have exposure, to generate sales and to progress that way, but you're also depriving people who would love your work the opportunity to experience it and possess it. And um, so you're not really doing anyone a favor by, by waiting, um, you, you know, waiting around and hoping that uh, someone's going to find you and, and turn you into a success. Yeah, that's lovely. Yeah, it's true. You know, uh, my, my husband's an actor and he talks about trying out for roles. It's the same thing. You know, you can literally walk in there and be the best actor in the world and they go, yeah, but we wanted a blonde. I mean, it's that simple. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, I, I think that I, I suspect that if we dove into it, we could find a lot of parallels between acting and uh, musicians and 
fine artists, visual artists that, um, uh, y- you know, in the same way that uh, you just got to get out there and put yourself forward and that you're going to fall down on your face a lot of times before you find success, that that's true for, for all creatives. And don't take it personal, you know, yep. like it really could have, you're just too tall or I was picturing someone of this color or, you know, it, yep. sometimes it's that simple. And I've known even people that will look at my painting and I'm like, that's a, it's a word of Kavard. And, and they're like, but I wanted burgundy in it. Yes. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Which all of that, um, it, you know, it is natural to feel disappointed when you're not the one that's selected or you hear someone say no. But all of that makes it even more sweeter when it's your time, when the opportunity comes your direction and you do find that perfect fit um, and, and, and you start to find the sales. And um, I suspect that it would not be as satisfying or as, as fulfilling for an artist um, you know, to just just start seeing success immediately. We've got to get through some of that, pay the dues, so to speak. Yeah. You know, I was thinking about some of the things you said, and there's kind of a through line in the conversation of you, which is your creative DNA, which I almost would put out, like if I was to put a slogan over you, it would probably be just do it. Just just do it. <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that, that I when I was doing my workshops, the very last slide, um, I would say, I'm stealing this from Nike and I would have <laughs> it come up, just do it. So you're right on. Yeah, that, that's exactly it. Oh, that's that, so um, funny. <laughs> I, 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 that, that is exactly what I would recommend to artists. It's what I recommend to other gallery owners and people who are considering, um, you know, getting into the, into the business. And that is that um, the only way to make it happen is to do it. And so um, you're, you're, you're right on track. You, you pegged me, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you know, I have a background in that psychology. But so this is qu- question for you. So I guess now you're about to like open up a whole bunch of galleries all across the country, me. <laughs> you know, it's interesting that you say that um, because certainly that is a consideration, um, you know, with for any business owner. Um, and here we are, um, you know, here it is 20 years later, 20 plus years later since we first opened our gallery in Scottsdale. And um, Scottsdale happens to be a very seasonal art market. You know, when the temperatures start to heat up here, people disappear. And so there's, there would certainly be opportunities to do that. But what we've actually decided is that there's still so much potential for our current business. Um, you know, we, we just really started diving deeply into selling through social media and have started to see some real success there. Um, we, you know, we've been focused on cultivating up and coming artists and artists early in their careers. And that's been awesome, but there are also some opportunities to bring on some more established artists. And so at present, we've got so much, uh, my wife, Carrie, and I have so much that we still want to do in our Scottsdale location that uh, opening additional galleries just really isn't even um, uh, on the horizon at at this point, but we'll see what the future holds. Oh, come on, Jason, just do it, man. (laughs) (laughs) Just do it, just do it. (laughs) So anyway, is there anything else you'd like to share with the listeners that they should consider or, or that we haven't covered? Uh, you know, I think that that just in terms of um, in your daily practice, I would encourage artists to start to think about, think a little bit more about, um, if you will, my side of the equation, the business side of things. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm not saying stop thinking about being creative or stop enjoying the process, but if you can just add in a little bit of um, thinking about the logistics of building a successful business around your art, um, that it's going to make awesome things happen for you in your career and it's going to enrich your creative practice. And so if I can help with that, you know, the, the easiest way to, to find and follow me is to go to red.blog.com. So that's a little confusing um, name for the the blog. It's r e d d o t b l o g dot com. Um, but but again, I post hundreds of articles there. Um, you can follow for free, and it's a great way to kind of just start to dive in and to uh, become a part of a you know almost a family of other artists who like you might be interested in um, you know furthering your your career as an artist. And so I'd love to see you see all there. And so they also can take 
sign up for some of your courses, right? Yes. Yeah. There are opportunities if there are specific things that you're interested in, in terms of, you know, if you need some feedback on consistency, there are opportunities to do that. If you'd like more specific directions on how to approach galleries, there are opportunities for that as well. And so um, I, you know, I try to provide at different levels, anything an artist might need for uh, improving the business side of their art practice. So last question, you believe, do you believe then if people are focused and they, they do contribute some time to the business side and they play the numbers game that they can make a living from doing art? I work with many artists who have done just that. Um, I don't want to pretend that it's easy. And uh -huh. um, I would caution you that if you find someone in the art world saying that it's easy and that with four simple steps, you can be fabulously successful as an artist, because I think we all know intuitively that it is going to be an uphill climb and that it's going to take time. And uh, certainly the artists that I'm representing in my gallery have devoted uh, years and decades of their lives to figuring it out and building a successful business. But I would just say that it's never too late to start um, and that you know your definition of success is probably gonna be different from the artist standing next to you and that's okay. Um, but but that success is achievable. And if you have a desire to make a living as an artist, there's never been a better time to do it than right now. There are more people out there with disposable income who are interested in buying art. Um, there's never been a better way to, to reach out in terms of uh, you know being able to build your own networks through social media, to outreach to galleries electronically. And so, um, you know, it, it is certainly possible. It's going to take commitment on your part, but it, it can definitely be done. And if I can help you do it, I'd love to be able to do so. Well, that's great. That's very encouraging for the listeners, you know. So uh, um, I want to thank you for being on the show. This is Oh, been Chris, great. it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for having me and for what you're doing to, to reach out to the art community. Yeah, I love it. I love it. And I think that's the key too. when you do something you love, you know, what your success, what is your generation of success? Every day I get to do what I love, you yeah. know. And, Absolutely. And likewise, what you were saying, you know, and one of your suggestions is to paint every day or at least every week, <laughs> several times a week. So I like it. It's very pragmatic and very thoughtful. Um, uh, listeners, I would encourage you to follow this channel. I'm on YouTube. I'm also on the pod podcast players, any podcast player that you can find me. I'm there. Um, and we will have more interviews like this. I love having Jason on here. I love talking about art and how we can make it something that fits into our lives. So thank you for listening to the Spiritual Artist Podcast. We'll talk to you soon.